Um, good evening. This is Tuesday, February 27th, 2024, meeting of the town of Berlin Planning Board. As a preliminary matter, please note this meeting is being recorded and that some of the attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you. The ugly band t-shirt you decided to wear tonight or anything you intend to or not screen share on your computer. Anything you broadcast will be captured and recorded forever and ever and will possibly wind up as a TikTok video to be shared amongst your neighbors and friends. This is Tom Sanford, Chair of the Planning Board. Permit me to confirm that all members of the board are present and can hear me prior to the meeting being called to order. Planning Board members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Jay Teach. Here. Timothy Wheeler. Here. Carolyn McDonald. Here. Thomas Andrew. Here. Uh, with a, uh, and Peter Hoffman. <laughs> Not here. Uh, excellent. With a quorum of the board president, I call this meeting to order at 7.38 p.m. Tuesday, uh, February 27th, 27th, wow, 27th, 2024. This is an open meeting of the planning board being conducted remotely with consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of the emergency in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. Specific, specific information and general guidelines for the remote participation by members of the public can be found at the Town of Berlin website. The governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location and allows and encourages us to participate remotely. For this meeting, the planning board is convening using the Zoom platform as posted on the agenda, which includes links for the public to join this meeting. I'll introduce each speaker on the agenda after their concluding remarks. I'll invite each board member by name to provide any comments, questions, penetrating insights, and or motions. Please hold all your insights until your name is called. Board members, please remember to mute your telephone or computer when you're not speaking. Speak clearly to ensure the accurate minutes are recorded. For any response, please wait until you yielded the floor and state your name before speaking. If a board member wishes to engage in conversation with another board member, please do so through me to avoid multiple conversations at the same time. Lastly, please note that each vote in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Thank you all for your understanding and cooperation. Okay, first order of business is, can I entertain a motion or can I uh, hear a motion to accept the minutes of the meeting that we had uh, prior to this one? So moved. Any discussion? Any objections? Corrections? Okay, seeing none, I'll ask you to vote to accept the minutes of our last meeting. Carol McDonald? Aye. Jay Teach? Aye. Timothy Wheeler? Aye. Thomas Andrew? Aye. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Is there any bills that we need to take care of? No, we're in good mm -hmm. shape. Excellent. Any mail that we should be discussing or talking about? Hmm. Um, the mail we got is all agenda items. Okay. And whatever's in the post office down there, I'll check it. Okay. Good. All righty. Um, we have a few minutes before our first agenda item. Is there anything anybody needs to take care of really quickly? No. What did I send? I sent a few things around that was going. We're going to talk about the end, right? The... Right. Can you share your screen to show us the? Uh, oh, actually, Seth will probably have the plan that we can see. Yeah. Yeah, that property's up around that danger zone where there's all those bees flying around. <laughs> Get stung. Only a problem if you disturb them. Right. I don't know. Every once in a while, Jen's bees come up on our property in a giant ball. It's swarm. Oh, really? Yep. 
and then they find a fence post and they kind of hang out around there. I don't know if they're making something. Huh. How do you know they're hers? Um, they have a little name tags. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> Well, they have little advertisements on it that says, come buy ice cream when it rains. Yeah. <laughs> so somebody was supposed to have been writing this annual report for the planning board. I keep getting all these increasingly unfriendly emails about that. Apparently it was due on the 31st. Oops. I I just sent mine in like on Tuesday. Oh, did you? Yeah. Usually I have no problem doing it. This year I'm having a hard time. We kind of, I don't know, we didn't have a theme this year, it seems like. Did a little bit of a lot of different things. Do you cut and paste from last year? Some of it, like the the first part, which kind of explains what we do, I, re I reset. Yep. But then I have this file where I've got all of our minutes in it from the beginning of time. And uh, so you like get chat GPT to write it? Well, I go in there and pick things out of it, right? But it just, it's pretty time consuming. It's hard doing that on airplane, which is what I've been trying to do. <laughs> But last night, my flight was supposed to leave it at 7. It left at 11.30. I get in at 2 a.m. So I had a lot of time. Oh. With time Brad you had lots of time Hartford. sitting around the airport. Yeah. I've tried. I've been flying out of Hartford when I can. But there's the problem with that is there's at most one flight per day to any destination. Sometimes it's every other day. So if something goes wrong with the one you're on, you may have to stay in Florida for an extra couple of days. Or Hartford, you lead. depending on where you get stuck. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So far, it's been very reliable, and the airline is awesome. It's Breeze Airline. Uh huh. Spring hmm. planes, half the price of flying out of Boston with Delta, cheap parking. A lot of good yeah, things. my my daughter and um, son in law have taken it uh, a couple times down to South Carolina, and uh, and they they've been flying. They live in Vermont, but they drive down 91 and fly out of Hartford. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's convenient. Huh. What time is our first appointment? 7.45. I believe we have 7.45. Excellent. Okay. Is um, Seth or Mark in the audience? Mark is here. I'm not sure what number Randall wrote it is. Anybody know? Mark does. Hmm. Hello. There he is. Mark is it hey, 232? Uh, I, uh, when, uh, when you guys uh, asked about Seth having the plan, I, I, called, I called him, so he'll be on shortly. He's, he's just uh, setting up his computer right now to get on so he can uh, share the plan with you. Excellent. Yeah. Mark, what number Randall Road is it? 232 is the primary property. It's um, across from the fire pond, uh, the corner of Peach Hill there, uh, the corner of Powers Road, Powers and Randall. And then it goes all the way down past Peter Hoffman's on the opposite side of the street, all the way down to Judy Clark's. So it's on the far side? Drawing, drawing up. It's across from Peter Larson. Okay. It's across from Peter Hoffman. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that, that is there a time delay? Am I coming through good? You're fine. Okay. Yep. Are we just waiting for Seth or did, or we can if you guys have the plan, we could start some general can, discussion uh, as you go through it and he should be on any minute. You can put the plan up if you want. Oh, there's Seth. There we go. You see the plan? Uh, good evening. Sorry yep. for the late arrival. No problem. How are you, Seth? I'm doing well. So uh, this is Seth Donahoe with Bills and Roy. Mark just asked me to jump in and share the plan, but it looks like you have a plan before you already. Yep. Okay. So the same it's, one that you have, right? Exactly the same. Yep. Okay. So so we have submitted a A and R plan. Uh, the parent parcel is known as two thirty two Randall Road. And that has the existing house, which is near the bottom of your screen. And that is lot one, which is a conforming lot to both the frontage and area requirements. And then going along Randall Road to the east, you have lot two and lot three, which are both reduced frontage lots. Um, and then there's the remaining land of, of the current owner, which is identified as parcel A. Yeah, Jay. Can you zoom in even a little more, maybe? And you can see on the plan, there's a tabulation of the area. So we have the required frontage for the reduced frontage lots on lot two and three, which are 100 feet each. Uh, both lots flare out, so they're plenty wide, um, and they, they have well over the required area as well. What's parcel B? So parcel B, there's a note on the plan that is to be uh, um, conveyed to the abutter Curtis, which is on the right side of your screen. Um, so they are in Colburn Road, actually. So they'll be acquiring some additional land for their existing lot there. Oop, other side of the screen. Right hand corner. Right here. There you go. And so you can see there's a, the, a butter Curtis is identified there, 107 Coburn Road. Yeah, there's a locust map here you can see. And lot A is going to remain with the current house. Uh, so lot A, is, the Muth is the property owner right now, and that is their remaining land. Um, and Mark, is is there plans for that at this time? Uh, I'm, I'm purchasing the entire property with the exception of the home, and we're developing the two lots. They're selling off the little portion out back to the Curtises, and then the balance will remain in my possession in the future to be hopefully developed in the future, but not currently ready to be developed at this moment. And so, so that would be subject to a, a future plan before the board yes. at that time. Yeah, yeah. Future, another plan, some more testing, so forth and so on. So Tom, yeah. What, what, this is my first time seeing a reduced frontage lot. What does that mean and why? <clears throat> so reduced frontage lots uh, allow for um, rear, how, you know, lots that are larger than the, the minimum acreage. You can, if you protect, or if you create a larger lot, you can reduce the frontage. There are a couple of um, 
uh, stipulations. One is it can only it can't be any less than 100 feet of frontage, and it has to cannot be less than 200,000 square feet. Uh, all the other requirements have to be met for sidebacks and uh, setbacks, side uh, lot lines, that type of thing, uh, and no more than one such lot may be created for any continuous 400 feet of frontage. So you see, we've given you a tabulation there. So each of those lots exceed the 200,000 square feet required. Uh, right. with lot three is 240,000 and change. Lot two, lot two is 253,000. And both right. have 100 feet or more of frontage for that. And then their configuration also allows for the, the required separation. Um, essentially, that we cannot have two of these side by side. And we've not done that. Right, but no more than, than one such lot may be created for any continuous 400 feet of frontage. So I guess that makes makes that two, right? 100, 100. So how does that work with lot two, lot three with the, um, how much frontage do you have is 156 and 143 and 44 and 41, right? It's 85. I'm adding it up for you right now. Yeah. 400 feet. So that has the 400 feet separation distance exactly. It's exactly 400 feet. Yep, 4107, 5893, 143.54, and 154.46. Okay. Those courses are called out right there. Yep. And the bottom one would have 200 plus the lot one 200, so that would would conform on the other side of it. Yeah, lot lot one is has excess of the required frontage. It, it in itself has four hundred and twenty feet of okay. frontage. All right. So you meet the do you meet the standards for reduction of lot and frontages and what have you and the acreages? Does anybody else on the board have any questions? So uh, it's important to understand that this single parcel is being divided into four lots right now. If this parcel is broken up into any more than one additional lot, we would begin to require some affordable units. That's that that's gotten by us twice with A and R's um, over the last couple years, and and we need to be cognizant of that going forward. So I think that just needs to be in the minutes. Any other questions or comments? Only because I'm curious. Jay, yeah. can you um, move the screen down a little to show the lot that's being cut out of the middle? So how was, how were those, how was, how was this delineated? Like what were, are there physical bear boundaries? Like, does it make sense 
in real life as to why those lines are drawn that way? That's a great question. And, and right now what we're doing is the soil testing and those lots have been configured uh, based on where suitable soils have been found for septic systems. So we're planning around the septic systems for those future lots. Um, and that's why they have the odd shape and that they're not rectangular. Okay, thank you. Just curious. Um, Peter, I think has his hand up. Yep. So um, two questions, where are the driveways gonna go? And um, do you have any, Mark, do you have any idea where you, what you will do in the future in terms of subdividing further? Uh, nothing to disclose at this point and where the driveways go are not relevant for this. Uh, this is a planning board a &R hearing for approval of an a &R, which is approval not required. These are questions that apply to any future hearing for any future development. It would still be nice if you knew where they were going to go, Mark, to disclose it. <laughs> Within the 100 feet, you know, <laughs> there's not much room, you know, where they physically can go. Yep. They're downhill. They're not in, in front of your driveway. They're not going to shed any light on you. They're not going to cause any issue with you. They're not going to destroy your view. They're not going to impact on you or impede on you in any way. Uh, all right. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Would somebody be interested in making a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion to approve the a and r plan. Jay, can you go down to the corner so I can see the date of the plan? A and r oh other yeah, I'm just making it bigger for you. <laughs> There you go. Uh, the um, plan prepared by Dillis and Roy dated January 28th, 2024 for William and Barbara Muth, 232 Randall Road. Can you um, reference the book and page for us, please? Yeah. Um, if we can find it. It's on there. Yeah, I'm sure. You got to go to the other side, unfortunately. Here is here, 974, 88. You see it? Yep, book and page 974, or book 974, page 88, or is that plate? So those are the uh, plan references, the yep. deed references above it, which is book. Oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. 96. All right, Jay, you're going to have to zoom in a little more for that. There we go. Book 16173 16, page 96 Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a um A proposal in a second. Um, any other discussion? Any other further comments? We need to note that parcel B is doesn't have frontage and is not considered a building lot, or are we good with it? Um, it's landlocked already. Yeah. But it's not noted on the plan. It's not not a not a building lot. I, it is hey, actually. Is it? I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't really see. Quite all right. No. Where is it? Um, My apologies. Not somewhere. Yep, I see it now. Thank you. All right, we have a motion in a second. Um, at this point, I'll ask you to vote to uh, on this uh, on the proposal. Colin McDonald. Aye. Jay Teach. Aye. Thomas Andrew? Aye. Timothy Wheeler? 
Aye. Uh, Tom Sanford, aye. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. So we need to get um, the mylar and two copies so we can get signatures on this. We need to calculate the fee. And we need to calculate your fee. Under our new fees. I think it's 100 for the first lot and 50 for the remaining. Is that what it is? Yep. So this, we created four lots of five. One, two, three, four, five. The fifth one, you got A, B, one, and two, right? Oh, and then the one that they're keeping. You got the little parcel B. No. Okay, one, two, three, A, and three. B. That's five, yeah. It's actually two lot, three lots and two parcels. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Do we charge for unbuildable? It's only for building lots, right? Creation of a lot, though. Um, right now, we can charge for creation of an open space parcel. And this is something that's just being added to somebody else's land, which would be the lot that's already created. So it's a parcel being added to a piece of land. But it's up to you guys. Yeah, I think I look at it as five as five. So, okay. I think that's what we've traditionally done whenever yeah. there's a distinct piece independent of any others not a problem so that's five hundred dollars what's i what's j j did you do the calculus um what did i say it was a hundred for the 150 for the first and 100 for the others <laughs> oh okay is that right? What he said? That, that seems it. excessive. Yeah, I, it was a hundred. I just saw it in our minutes. I think you said a hundred for the first lot and fifty for the others. Yeah. Okay. So that would make yeah. it um, three hundred, right? Yeah. 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 I'll I'll verify that afterwards. Okay. If you want to just forward that number to me, I can bring the check in the mylar to the selectman secretary in the morning if that works for you guys. Sure. Yeah, we're running around. Awesome. All righty. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right. Have a good evening, guys. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Good night. Right, thank you. Good night. Thanks, Seth. Jay, Wait, can you stop um, sharing? Yeah, if I can. Oh, there it is. I got three screens. I have to find a little red button. <laughs> okay. Um, eight o'clock is the person uh, for River Road West, right? Um, let's see here. I don't have the agenda in front yeah. of me. Yeah, yeah, it's Mark. There's two people, eight and eight fifteen. Right. Questions. Let me make sure I got verification from. I think everybody responded. Right. So there's a bunch of people in the audience. What's the first name of the people or the name of the people in at eight? Uh, Mark Yadinisernia. Hmm. If someone in the audience is here for the eight o'clock, that would be that appointment. Person. Yeah. Please raise your hand. Mark. Mm, no hands. The second person is Katie. Katie. Pro. Yep. Yep. I guess you could switch them. I don't know. Yeah, we can um, switch them. They're both just looking for information. There's no votes or anything. Yeah, no, she's here. I'm just trying to. There we go. Hey, Katie. Yeah. 
Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So what's your what's your interest? What would you uh, like to know from us? Sure. Uh, so the interest on on the parcel of land, um, Phil and Eat Foundation is a nonprofit organization. We're a 501c3. And um, the idea is to put a program there, which is a day program um, that is a community based program that helps adults high functioning autism learn vocational skills. OK. The idea is to get them as much training as possible on different vocational areas like landscaping or gardening or working in a kitchen or a bakery or, um, you know, even in a working some wood shop so that they can get a lot of skills uh, with the pro proper support and training and guidance and then get them moved into the community with local, um, you know, uh, family owned or small companies that are in the community. So you're building a school? It is a school for vocational for over 18. Um, but the question I have for the board is the it was designed to be financially self-sustaining. So we don't have to depend on outside funding. So the creations or the elements that the, the students are working on will bring in funding for themselves, uh, whether it's making garden tables or making apple pies or whatever that might be. In order for that to happen, I need to open up stores, restaurant type retail things to the general public. But it is a 501c3. 100% of the proceeds will stay on campus. Um, so I've, I've researched a lot on the 501c3 and as far as zoning and, and what I'm able to do and not do. Um, and it is, uh, they will also be uh, being offered there um, some educational pieces as well while they're on campus which would be for, for some of them getting a college degree online with support in a computer lab from us, um, as well as the uh, different therapies that they're going to still need after 18. So how big of a campus are you planning on building? Uh, well, we're not subdividing the land. The land will all be for Philony Foundation. R right. But so how many, approximately how many buildings would you it's approximately two buildings outside of greenhouses and a barn because we intend to have horses as well. Um, it, it's because the students will be divided among the campus on different elements of departments of where they'll be learning skills. It's going to help about 250 adults with autism and it will be based basically with the, um, with the elements of the retail it will also be employing about 200 members of your community. And I just need to renovate that this is not a residential program. This is a day program only. But it'll have a, a, a retail or a restaurant or something where you're inviting the general public onto the yeah. property. Yeah, so in front, there'll be like a plaza that will house the restaurant pieces, of bakery, flower shop, gift store, that kind of elements. It's like a plaza for the general public. And after mm -hmm. proceeds are made within that plaza, it goes into the school building that will be behind that plaza. Okay. Hmm. I'm kind of curious about the scope of this. Like, what do you expect it to cost and how much of it have you raised so far? And then, you know, where's the money going to come from? We have uh, one major donor um, that's piecing it as we go. Um, and we have the money to purchase the land as of right now. Um, and we have funding to start the preliminary site planning. Um, we also have a... a connections with Congress on getting grants. So we have somebody working with one of our Congresswomen on grant writing to get us in the right direction and getting some of the federal government grants that are out there for uh, special needs. And also, um, but mainly it's, it's the one donor that we have. Yeah. Scope of work is probably um, outside of land, it's probably gonna be about five to 6 million 
when everything is set done with the septic and well, and we're, we plan on putting solar systems and doing a lot of the, the campus itself was designed to be a green campus. So we'll be doing a lot of things like um, uh, recycling water into toilet systems. And we have a green engineer that it, his, his company specifically works with designing septic and well and, and other elements of our buildings that are gonna be green technology. There's gonna be farming as well. And that's the idea of teaching the kids farm to table. I'm sorry, adults, I say kids, but it's the adults. And when you say adult, you, they're legally adults, but they are in their 20s and 30s. Yeah, it, it, it's there's a cap. What the idea really is, is bringing them in and getting them trained so they can get in and be connected into their community. Um, and so the youngest will be allowed to come at 18. There is, there are even though Massachusetts allows these individuals with these disorders to stay in school until 22, there are a lot of families that would actually prefer them learning some vocational skills and getting out of that school setting where they're not learning anymore. And so this is offers. And, but we're also hopefully what the idea and the wish list is to work with the high schools within the area so that we can do heart and heart. Like some of them actually will benefit very much from getting some more so solid education, but yet learning some vocational skills. And hopefully being able to take some of those 18 year olds and doing half a day in the campus, learning some nice vocational skills, getting them prepared. And once they do graduate and also staying in the high school setting where some parents will prefer. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, that's why we're saying 18 and over. It's not set in stone because they, everyone, these individuals all need very, very, very different uh, programs, very, very different schedules, very, very different, um, you know, structure and support. So the idea is just like a community college is to base each one of their needs and their passions based off what, what they need and, and put a program together that's in, that will support them 100% and stimulate them throughout the day instead of being at home. So Katie, are you affiliated with any other um, enterprises that are similar to this or is this a, a startup that's independent? Yeah, so this is a startup independent, but I have collaborated with many, many different programs. So what I did um, is right off the bat, I, I, you know, figuring out what what they need. And a lot of what com was coming back in my face was, well, these programs are offered for adults with autism and it would be one specific program. So I said, you know, let me go and search the United States and say, what's successful? What really does work? What really gives them a, a very... A, a wonderful life and existence and and, and, a, and something that they feel good and proud about. And I came across many things in the United States. One was the uh, Roses for Autism in Connecticut, very successful nursery. And a lot of uh, big outfits purchased their flowers from that organization in Connecticut. There's a wonderful, amazing, um, delicious uh, bakery in New Jersey. And she, I met with the owner many times and she only employs for the most part, adults with autism um, and it's very, very successful bakery. There's a tea house in Texas. There's a line out the door and they, they, they hire and support adults with autism. Um, I could go on and on. The list is pretty big, but they're all one thing. And what was, what I was fighting with is, well, what if an individual comes to us and they don't want to work in a garden? Or what if an individual comes to us and they don't want to work in a restaurant and they needed choices? I had choices and everyone in this board had choices and they need choices. So I really said it just designed it in my head saying we need to offer this to them. We need to say, all right, if Joe's going to come and Joe, these are Joe's challenges, but these are Joe's passions. So, OK, Joe, so you need some therapy in certain areas, but you also love working in the garden and you really love working in the kitchen. So we're going to get you started in your program on working in the garden and bringing in elements into the learning kitchen and preparing some some maybe vegetables or breads or baked goods for the bakery or the restaurant. And then that day they're going to go in to be served to the general public. And that gets him started and he gets him on a, a, a journey and a, and a road that he's passionate about. And he can actually put more energy and effort into something that he really is enjoying. Um, then again, it's okay, but someone else comes in and they don't like either of those things, but they, they are amazing craftsmen with woodwork, believe it or not, don't speak, but maybe they can make 
incredible wood crafts, uh, pieces out of wood. And so, and they also love riding horses or they, they like uh, working in the art department. So we would design their day based off what their passions are and get them stimulated through the day and make sure they're supported. And again, if he's making garden tables, those garden tables will go out front to the gift store and sold to the general public. And that way, all those proceeds then will go back and feed for Joe and, and, and Karen and anyone else that's in the school to be able to have a successful day program and get them um, working. So there are a lot of schools under 22 that try to put programs together for adults after 22. And I have spoken to probably about 20, 28 to 30 of these schools that are trying to put these programs together. Some of them have been successful in COVID. They had to shut some of their programs down, unfortunately, but some of them are successful and some of them, but all of them say to me, yes, it's a day program, but it's, it's not learning vocational skills a full day to get them in the community. This is to get them to have somewhere to go when they leave high school or when they're done with us. And they all are doing that and they are all supporting this program because they know this program is going to get their students even above and beyond and closer to their potentials how so we have a lot of support the, um, um i'm sorry how does this relate to the uh, autism center that's in berlin now the autism centers are typically for um you mean for i'm sorry i can't i'm having a hard time hearing you the autism centers like the one in the one that's in berlin at the traffic circle that, from what I understand, is under 22. That's for children. That's like for social skills and learning ABA. It's an ABA program, and that's a behavioral analysis therape therapeutic program. So parents or people or families are bringing their children there to get one-on-one -on -one therapy pro or maybe in group therapy, but that is a specific type of therapy program, ABA. And also um, the Doug Flutie Foundation supporting us. We have some of their members on our board of advisors as well. Um, we're joining forces with them. And uh, Melmark out in uh, Andover, um, the director there is supporting what we're doing as well. We've, we've worked hand on hand. They've been collaborating with us over the years trying to get this thing moving as well. So we do have a lot of collaborations in place um, and we have a lot of support from on the government end. Um, so it really was just getting a piece of land and getting it moving. It, it, we did kind of break it out to be more of a national program. Uh, we do have high hopes that once we get this one up and running, because wholeheartedly, with all respect, it will help 250 adults, and that is already full. And that's been full for 10 years. So. Uh, we need more programs like this to get these individuals um, solid support and um, training so that they can be more involved in the communities. Wait, what, what did you say was already full? <laughs> we are, the, the, there's a waiting list to get into a program like this. I have enough emails to say that I have enough individuals that this is already full and we haven't even broken ground enough families that are supporting and that are that are part of Philly Foundation in the area. And the people that come to your program are they're they're paying their own way or how there's a very small tuition, but it's we we kind of structured it based off what they would be receiving once they're adults from the federal government and what their their challenges are, if whether it's speech or OT or anything like that, they get a stipend. And so we kind of gauged for small tuition based off what the family is already going to be receiving to support their adult. And it just would be end up going to this program. That's why the financial piece oh, and, and connecting with the community and bridging the gap between the community and these adults is super, super crucial in order for them to be able to have placement. We're not, we're not asking more from the community, not asking taxpayers to pay for this. We're asking for our community to say, do you, would you like to go get a dinner? Would you like to go buy some flowers? Or would you like to buy something in a gift store? Let's shop, maybe it's a picture frame or maybe it's, a, it's um, holiday cards, whatever it might be that if you, if, you, if we, and, and, and that's another piece of it. All we have to do at Phil and e is 
to right off the bat, we can get people there to the retail and it's our job to keep them there. It's our job to do it right and do it well and do it with quality and do it so, so that the community wants to go there. And that's what we've worked very hard on putting all those pieces in place to know what that's going to look like and what's going to keep people from coming, uh, make keep people to keep coming to support a program like this. It's going to be they're going to go because they want to go to that restaurant or they want to get the baked goods from that bakery because they're so delicious. They're not they're going to not even think that they're going to support that because of what it's doing in the background. This is going to be a plaza for the community. It's going to be a place for them to go to and enjoy and want to go to. It just so happens their proceeds 100 percent will be supporting 250 adults that don't have a future at the moment. Well, it certainly sounds like a worthwhile, worthwhile cause. Um, there are some challenges with the designation of this property um, and some of the proposed um, uses that you want to want to put on it. And it's it's it, the cha the challenge I'm having is is there's some things that are allowed and then some things uh, that aren't allowed, and uh, it's all wrapped up within a you know, a, a, a not-for-profit educational use. So what trumps what? Yeah, I think we're going to end up needing some guidance um, from town council to try to interpret whether a f um, ancillary uses to a primary use that's allowed when it's a 501c3 in a educational mm -hmm. use on a on a campus you know uh you know are those tangential uses allowed or would they have to get a special permit and how would the Board of Appeals accomplish that, you know. Um, it, it's they're good. It's you know it's an interesting, interesting proposal. But it we need to we need to do a little research, I think. Right. Because if we, we want them to be able to go to the ZBA with a, a clearly clearly defined um, request. Uh, because I mean it, and and we can help them more with that. I mean, the ZBA isn't going to have much discussion ahead of time about how to how to um, sort of reconcile these the the various uses that might might not be allowed. So under five hundred one c three, what portion of the program is is are you questioning? Well, it's the retail aspect. If if your retail ends up being standalone, um, you know if you can, it may very well be that if the retail can be integrated into the the facility in such a way that it's seamless, you know, like the the, the bakery is right there with the with the sales area for the bakery, or the wood shop is is right there. You know, you're almost looking through glass watching people. I wonder if, if, as opposed to an independent structure that would sell product that's produced in in some you know other series of buildings or a building in behind or something like that. I, I think that maybe I misspoke. I wasn't trying to separate it so that the community didn't know what was happening there. That's not my intention. Well, um, I mean, the but design... you, you you did speak about sort of a you know, uh, it's a series of storefronts almost along River Road as opposed to back into the property. A, a plaza that is going to be in the front of the property, correct? But what yeah, we but, intend for a design. So if, yeah, so I, I'm wondering if the plaza isn't a plaza, but if, if you're if you're really going into the property and that when you're in the property that there's, you know, everything is 
sort of continue it continues to you leave that berm there you know you're into the property you're you're you've got these various uses that are going on there and they're integrated in such a way that it's seamless it, that's what we we can throw that at town council and get some feedback yeah because so, so what you're saying is under the 501c3 i'm not allowed to have retail well that's the i i i don't know how how to answer that question it off the top of my head i'd say if if you didn't have you could be a nonprofit without an educational component if you came to me and said all we want to do is have we have a 501c3 that's going to sell widgets in a facility on that site um would that be allowed i i'd have to scratch my head and say i don't know if a if if it's a commercial venture and it's a 501c3 whether that floats but you've got this educational component that's to me your primary objective right well it's it's vocational which, which vocational educational but isn't that's, that's your knowledge? primary objective isn't that allowed in the limited business yeah Public, private yeah Nonprofit so, educational institutions right, right. And, and and to be a 5013c you must be have an educational um that must be your focus is education so you know i would assume that town council would then say yeah it's fine but right. I, that's the that's, that's their the, primary and then their answer like you said the tangential or ancillary things that's where the gray area for me is if it, right. if, it's, if it's if it was that use alone that's not allowed in the in the limited business but how does that square when it's wrapped around a you know, right. the educational portion of it which trumps or which you know if that's your primary goal and that's an ancillary is that allowed and i i i don't know the answer i maybe town council can give us the guidance but like yeah. you said whatever is if it if that's the pathway and it's teed up properly we can sort of shepherd this through the zba and it should be a fairly easy path forward right yeah. i would also i think it would be helpful to have some sort of calculation about percentage of building that is de dedicated to education versus retail okay if I it's... definitely yes it's um what's hard on that is <clears throat> i would have to just do individual areas because for for like the restaurant they're going to be in the restaurant learning how to work in a restaurant mm -hmm. they're going to be in the storefronts at the cash register learning how to be work in retail they're yeah. going to be so that's that's almost so um, they're not even specifically just retail or no. just right. restaurant they do include an educational component right. yes yeah. which yes. but then that vocational piece falls in on helping them to get jobs in the community right Perfect. sure if you did it by even if you did it by head count you know if you had yeah. you know 15 of the or maybe that's even too many people we'll call it 15 in the restaurant out you know in back out front and you know and there um there's another 10 that are are supporting them you know you could do it by percentage of headcount okay then you know you got two-thirds one-third and do that square footage and if that piece is 2,000 right. square feet then mm -hmm. two-thirds of it's going to be educational por portion of it I think that's fine I mean we don't have to have it you know exact square footage but sure. just an idea of it's not the other way around that two-thirds of it's for profit or or for retail <clears throat> and the one third is the educational component. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Just yeah, but to, I no, think there, there, there were many other properties that we looked at um, and that we were co contemplating on um, in other towns in the area. Uh, and and I did get the okay from several of them on on the whole program. Um, but they some of them were as low as four four acres. 
And we were able to, without an issue, put what we are trying to design on four acres. And so having 29 acres is, is a huge plus. It's more, it's more area for, um, you know, even like my husband said, you can do so much with the community with, with this. You could actually put a walking trail on the whole property for the community. You could, you could actually invite the community in to do a lot of great things because that's the whole idea. It's called Bridge the Gap. And that's the, 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 the whole right. model of our, our, our organization. Yep. Well, and I think your last few comments about the way in which that restaurant integrates with your educational goals or the retail shop for the you know, craft items that are prepared or whatever, that that's a big hurdle in my mind in terms of the way in which we 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 can integrate that commercial use with the with the educational use and it becomes a lot simpler to understand. So it's a hurdle that you don't like the idea of me saying that they're integrated or you do? No, like no. I think it's important that they're integrated because okay. otherwise when they're, and initially, as you talked about it, um, I I was envisioning a, a separated retail space. But what you're talking about is an integrated retail space right. that really right. utilizes the, 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 the students or the folks that are benefiting from this in an educational piece that's you know essential essential you know so and I, I, think, and I, I definitely did yep. miss this speak on that i apologize so that's good i mean i think we can talk to heather and and uh and just explain what it is that this is trying to accomplish and then uh you know you, you could begin to begin to package up your site plan so you could go to zba okay so um, do we think we can have an answer or some guidance before our next meeting, Tim? Yeah, I mean, I'm perfectly willing to to speak to Kristen and get permission to talk to town council so we get okay. a clearer reading. Okay, then let's, um, let's we're bumping up against our agenda. So yeah. why don't we, um, Katie, we'll do a little homework on our end. Okay. And our next meeting is... What's the date? The tenth. Sure. Eleventh. Hmm. I think it's the tenth. Uh, there are two hands up. March. Well. Uh, okay, real quick, because we're going to run into some. Yeah, March twelfth is the next 12th. meeting. March twelfth. Um. So Peter's had his hands uh, hand up, almost the whole time. So I'll make it quick. Where on River Road West is this? And is to, does someone have an image they can share? Uh, where it is. The Worcester gravel, sand and gravel, gravel site. Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay, thank you. And Karen. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Sorry, I was spacing out there. Um. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Hi, Karen. Hi. Um, for the gal on the phone, is her name Kate? Katie. Katie, yes, that's correct. Yeah, Katie. Hi, Katie. I'm the abutter directly across the street from that parcel of land. And um, it was not very clear to me at all. I know that we wrapped up a little bit here, but you started out with a school in the back and a plaza in the front, and you ended up with everything being integrated. Is that correct? Well, the buildings themselves will be situated on the property in that order, but it, the, the students will be integrated throughout the buildings. So there is a retail front in front of the school. Yes, that's correct. So it is a separate school in the back and parking lots and retail, like mall retail, happening to sell all the items that the people make. Yes, that's correct for the community. And we have other elements that we're going to incorporate for the community as well. Uh -huh. And there's a, a berm that along that road, um, other builders have incorporated as part of retaining the character of Berlin. Is it important for you to take the berms down to have um, retailer-like access directly off River Road? No, that wasn't a concern of mine uh, when looking at the property. Um, I, I do not have my engineers on site yet. I do not have, um, you know, I, I am the architect, so I don't have my team on site yet. I'm not sure what kind of questions that's going to bring for the design and the overwhelm. The, getting the flow going for, for the project. Um, but it wasn't a concern when we first looked at the property. Okay. Because there are other um, 
opportunities for that land. And one of the things as the abutters, there's a number of neighbors on the phone this evening who are abutters on either side of you and a couple in front of that uh, piece of land. And it's important for the residents to retain that berm and uh, help retain the rural feel of Berlin, Massachusetts. So I think that if your architect and land designers were intending to take down the berm and have retail storefronts in front of the housing, uh, standalone housings across the street, that would be met with some contention. I understand this project is a, it's a pretty extensive project and we know uh, that it's not going to be um, you know, 100% open arms, like there's definitely questions and we're prepared to answer any questions. We want to work with the community. We don't want to work against any community. This is something we want to engage with all of the members of your community. And we also want to make sure that you feel welcome onto this property. It's something we're very, very like, I, if, I know you, you heard me speak that this is a green program. We want to be as green as possible and making it as healthy as possible for anyone coming onto the property, whether for retail or whether it's the students coming on board. So we're very, very in tune with with keeping nature in, in preserved and very, very in tune with making sure that we're making this as much of a rural and, and um, you know, more natural project as possible. You know, we like the idea of having, you know, fountains and, and you know, streams that, that people can walk by or, or whether or not it's, you know, we don't want to cut trees down. We want to make sure we're preserving as much as we can. We're all about, you know, the keeping as much of, of what's on that property as possible. We know that it's an open property, but we love the, the idea of making sure that it's not a flat parking lot. We want to stay as far away from that as possible. Uh -huh. Well, it sounds absolutely delightful. Are you willing or are your uh, people willing to write into the uh, opportunity to preserve all of the berm along River Road as part of the uh, exchange for some type of a zoning change for that land to accommodate some of these things? Yeah, definitely. Any of these kind of conversations are we're 100% want to have. We just want to make sure that the conversations with the board start where they need to start the, in, in, in making sure that I'm presenting with them all the material they need to make their decisions for us to go forward with the land. Everything else, we have no issues whatsoever with making sure that everyone is happy across the board for this project. This project is about is about the disabled. It's not about me and it's not about anyone else. It's about their needs, but keeping really, really clear on our intent on the project as an architect is we are 100% wanting to make sure that we keep as much of that property intact as, as possible. We don't like throwing things in that look like, uh, what's the, the phrase, a square in a round, uh, square in a round hole, you know, that kind of situation. We're not trying to do that. We're going to make it as natural feel and looking as possible, uh, right down to the fact that we have a green engineer working with us. We have architects working with, you know, materials that make it feel like it's on-site material. We're not going to be putting up something that looks like it doesn't belong. We want to make sure that we're incorporated with your community. And what about, um, okay, hold on, I hold estimated on, hold on, that hold there on, were... Hold on, hold on, I got the last word because we're, like I said, we we're bumping up against this and sure. I understand, Karen, you have a lot of questions and concerns and, and I want you to get the answers, but, you know, this was just preliminary. We need to do some homework on our end. We're going to have another meeting um, about this and we can flesh out and get some additional information and um, you can have your list of questions. Katie can provide the responses, but I, I got to keep this agenda going because we have other people sure. that- um, I just want to position that she's mentioned about 450 people coming into that site every day and the roads have to be addressed. Okay. All righty. So we'll do our homework. Katie, um, if you um, are available for our next meeting, um, I, Jay can put you on the agenda and we can have a, um, a little bit longer uh, discussion. Um, and if, I think that if, I don't know whether you have even a preliminary rendering or something that you can kind of sketch out or kind of get an idea of what your vision is so that you can share it with us. It can be very sketchy and preliminary, uh, but I think it'll give everybody an understanding of what, how you're envisioning where this is going to go. Sure. We have a lot of preliminary ideas on our website, yeah. um, but they're based off a, a much smaller scale. Um, okay. not to say that we would spread it all out. It's going to have to function 
you know, appropriately. So our Absolutely. website does it'll hold give, some information. It'll give us an idea of, of, you know, what we're discussing. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And, and a, yes, I will be available for the next meeting. I'm sorry, Jay? There's, there's a, like a rendering of a concept on the website, I saw. Yes, yes. But I do have some, if, if you need something more substantial, I can email stuff over. Okay. I, again, it's not for the site because we're, we didn't. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Uh, anybody else that has a quick question or anybody else from the board have anything? There is one more audience member with their hand up. All right. Real quick. Michael. Hi, I have a very quick question. Uh, does this proposal supersede the uh, uh, mixed housing proposal we had heard weeks ago? I believe that that builder has withdrawn. Yeah. Okay. This is a, I mean, I mean, another really proposal for that uh, property. There's going to be a there's a warrant article for the um, town meeting. Okay. There is. Yep. Change the zoning from uh, LB to RA. That's the only thing that's um, tangible right. in this property. Okay. All right. That'll do. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Michael. All righty. Thank you, Katie. Um, we're, we now have our agenda's gone sideways. Um, Sorry. That's okay. No, no, no. It's not your fault. Um, my fault. Uh, is there the uh, what was his name? Mark? Is Mark on? No, no, it's uh, hmm? uh, uh, there's no new people in the audience, so okay, okay, all right. Then, then... was going to come, thought he had responded and was going to come. Let me check. So we'll move on to the. Uh, oh, the... hold on. We do Oops. have a new hand up. Okay. Hold on. Katie, I'm going to put you back in the audience. Okay, thank you. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, yep. we can. How do you pronounce your this name? Is Josue from Funbox. Okay. So we would like to open this fun box at the Solomon Pond Mall. Um, okay. We've done Cape, Cape Cod Mall last year. We've done other uh, malls in New Jersey, Connecticut, Florida. Uh, we would just like to inquire about what the permit process is for this event to happen. Okay. Did we have, um, we saw the, um... Sort of like a preliminary of where that it was on the site, right? Yeah. Yes. That the, the last meeting. Yeah. Do we have that? Can we share that? Yep. One second. Please. Um, I'm going to back up to last meeting, I think. There it is. Okay. And we determined this was all in Berlin, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, and so did we, we determine whether this needed a special permit or was this, it's not, oh, <laughs> this is the tricky slope. <laughs> 
right? Last year, there was a circus here. Okay. Right. And I don't believe we participated in that discussion at all. I'll guarantee you we didn't. We were not asked. We said it was our responsibility. That's why he's with us today. So say that again, Richard. No, that last year, last meeting, we discussed whether we were responsible for this or not, and we concluded that we were. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I've I've done a little research, and um, I it it probably needs to if if the circus was something that the town allowed this may very well be in a similar vein to the circus and they just need to go through the permitting process that the circus went through you know select board and fire department and uh, all that sort of stuff but i'd like to hear what i I, I wonder if Thomas has a, a, a thought or two. <laughs> yeah, well, I was, I was thinking of along the same lines as you just expressed. Um, I don't think it's it's a planning board issue per se. I think it's just a general event permitting issue. Last meeting, my memory of it was that we didn't determine it was the planning board's responsibility. We determined it was in Berlin and not in Marlboro and that it had to come to Berlin. That's all I remember about it. No, no, we did. Um, it's in the minutes that we just approved. Okay. Right. Uh, it's ours versus Z, like ZBA. It it may not belong to any land use group at all. It, yeah. It, it It's a temporary use that's um not structural it, it's it's structural only in the sense that the fire department would probably want to make sure that things are as they did with the circus you know if you put up a tent or you, you know there's certain fire controls and safety controls that are in place but uh that's all outside of our jurisdiction and it's not permanent it's what are we talking about two months I believe it's three months and we're only open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yeah. So, yeah. Definitely temporary in nature. Yeah. But how does this jive with the um the 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 development agreement that the that was part of the mall? I mean, this is was never envisioned, I would imagine, in that and there was probably no language in there that talks about this type of a temporary use or circus use or anything like that, right? Yeah, we we never forecast this type of use. Certainly, no. Nope. Um, right. Our crystal ball wasn't that clear. <laughs> well, I'm sure we didn't predict COVID or anything else that ran along those lines in the last 25 years that the development agreement was put into place. You know, the permissible parking area is is set out and. This is in the permissible park, impervious area, I guess, is what we call this, permissible mm -hmm. impervious area. Um, and so I think, I mean, it's if the if the Board of Selectmen and the Fire Department um, have issued permits for something similar in the light of the circus in the past, it seems like they've assumed that it's a it's an allowed temporary use um, and it doesn't interfere with the operation of the mall in any way. It, it may enhance it actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's certainly nothing that jumps out at me in terms of uh, the use of land or the overarching uses in the overlay district that would prohibit this, and um, yeah, and I, and I don't see that it activates any uh, any planning board review. I think, other than perhaps to say we wouldn't, you know, we would raise no objection to it. 
um, you know, as being an allowable temporary use uh, in the overlay district. Okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna send them to the select board. But... So Karen has her hand up. When you're ready for audience participation. Okay, one second. Um... Is there any other um, board member that has any comments or penetrating insights or anything they want to discuss? Or I, start taking well, I would, I would simply say, yeah, I would simply say before we open it up to the general public, right? it seems to me that the scope of what we're talking about here is that this is effectively, if you will, A and R. Our approval is not required. We don't have any, you know, we don't have any particular jurisdiction or ability to govern hours of operation, safety, all of that stuff. All we are saying is, as a matter of the bylaw, that we have no objection. So if, if you know, I'm mindful of the fact we've, you know, we've gotten, uh, you know, off, uh, you know, behind in the agenda, and I wouldn't want to talk a long time about things that we have no say over. Got it. Thank you. That's what I was hoping somebody would yeah. codify or quantify. All right. So that being said, let's uh, open it up to audience members. Hi, thank you for um, unmuting me. So the neighborhood does have concerns around this when the uh, circus was in place there were several calls each night to the police department and um, various people about the noise it was supposed to close at a certain time and it did not and music and bands were playing hour to two hours beyond what the closing time was i don't know where that comes in if it's not the planning board um, if it's the zba but it is um, a noise issue and there are certain things around noise and it is a problem with enforcing closing time yeah and i think i think it was probably the selectmen i don't want to throw them under the the bus here or anything but if they gave the permit for the circus they would be the ones who were giving this mm -hmm. and they would be the ones who would be establishing the conditions Mm -hmm. And presumably they would have had had the experience of those calls and, you know, and learned from those. But we we have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and recognizing perfectly your your concerns. It's just. Um, you know, as a planning board or, you know, a ZBA, where I think what we're saying here is this is not a planning uh, or land use issue. This is an event permitting issue. And so uh, it should move along to the event permitting and you should bring your concerns there. Mm -hmm. Right, I just wanna make it known while the gentleman is on the phone or on the Zoom call, hours of operation noise. The, the circus was much shorter to have three months of summer months, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with uh, the noise in the backyard and it being unable to shut down at 7 p.m. is tough. So for the purposes of the minutes we're documenting it and the neighborhood will go to the selectmen but we want to make everybody aware of while the circus went in there and that's not what was agreed on the mall land uh, um, we continue to have scope creep okay so noted is there any other um, audience member that has a comment or a question I don't see any other hands. Okay, then our recommendation to uh, the gentleman on the, that's proposing this uh, would be that you need to go through the permitting process, which would be with the select board. Okay, and I would I would further offer that um, you know a motion to send a message to the selectman that we don't see. Uh, you know, planning, land use, zoning bylaw issue with respect to this. And then we see it as a event permitting issue. Okay. Okay. Agreed. 
Do you want you want to codify that in a motion, Thomas, or you want to just as a note? I make a motion that we uh, we send a communication to the selectmen indicating that we don't see a um, zoning bylaw or land use issue and that this is purely an event permitting issue. Okay. We have a second. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Anybody want to add or subtract anything from that? Okay, seeing none, I'll ask you to vote on the motion that Thomas made. Carolyn McDonald? Aye. Jay Teach? Aye. Thomas Andrew? Aye. Timothy Wheeler? Aye. And Tom Sanford, aye. Motion carries unanimous to make a communication to the, or communicate to the select board. Is that something that Thomas is willing to draft an email to? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Yep. We do we do have another hand in the audience. Okay. Um, Michael? At uh, 175 River Road. Um, I'd just like to add my name to uh, Karen's concerns about the notice. Okay. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All righty. Does that uh, answer your questions? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. All righty, we are almost on track. Is there anything else that needs to be? Is there anybody else that has the other person didn't show up, right? There's nobody else in the audience. Correct. Up okay. Yeah. So we're back on track. Jay, can uh, you unshare? What? Jay. Was our updates on cottage cottage housing and school school enrollment? Okay. Did you do that? I did. Cool. I, I got that. tired of waiting for you. <laughs> Born or something. Yeah, powers. Nice. So, do you want to educate us on the? Well, the cottage housing update. That was uh, this guy, Tim Wheeler. I know him. I. Uh... I've reached out to the commission and suggested that we would be eager to participate in any additional discussions and if they want to do forums and whatever. And um, I haven't heard back on that. I have heard that the the um, housing trust is pursuing with Josefa and the commission um, a more thorough investigation of um, accessory dwelling units. And so that was one of the questions we were interested in as well. So they're, mm -hmm. they are moving forward with that. And I'll let you know as soon as I hear more about the cottage housing. I, I said, you know, we were sort of at an impasse because we're, as we look deeply into this, it, it didn't appear to us as though the goal of building small A affordable units was as achievable as we had first hoped by, you know, trying to establish this sort of cottage housing uh, overlay. And so if, if we had an opportunity to meet with some of the success stories with cottage housing and workforce housing, um, they might be able to share some of the ways in which they've made infrastructure and small scale housing and what's lot size and all this sort of stuff work in their communities. Um, so I'm, I'm convinced the commission will help us with it. It's just, they, they're working on this accessory dwelling unit thing full tilt right now. So we may see more results from that first. <clears throat> So we are 
we are likely or definitely going to have a town meeting in the fall. Um, he, yes. Kristen was at a meeting today and Peter was there. Um, we met with the mayor of Marlboro, the town planner from Marlboro, Liz from Solomon Pond, and a, a lawyer from Nutter, whatever, the land use law expert that uh, is going to help the folks that are working with the current owners of the mall to try to massage some of the language that's out there in terms of the zoning so it can be presented at a fall town meeting and Kristen said that um, in December is the target date for a town meeting. Um, and there are a number of other activities in town that are hoping that there'll be a fall town meeting. So yeah, it does look like there'll be something in December. And if, if the selectmen don't, I guess I'd say if the selectmen <laughs> don't schedule a fall town meeting, there'll be a citizen's petition to call a special town meeting, which... Mm -hmm. I think it requires a hundred signatures, but I know we could get a hundred signatures um, from the boards that really want to have a town meeting in the fall, so we can get some of this stuff off the table before the annual next May. You know, I mean, it just makes so much more sense. So yes, yeah. I guess the agenda for annual is already pretty um, packed. Yep. Yep. So we may or the warren uh, working on the cottage and in you file updates for december yeah and the in the discussion today the goal i think i shared a while back the the study that um the metropolitan area planning commission did for the town of the city of marlboro that looked at the entire stretch of Donna Lynch Boulevard. Yep. And so that was done in July of 21, and it sort of sat idle. And we looked at it, of course, and said to Liz at Solomon Pond, we'd be eager to be proactive about modifications to our, our overlay district for the mall and the development agreement in, in order to help them attract new tenants um, because we felt if if we could be more aggressive and proactive we wouldn't need to be reactive to some crazy proposal we could you know settle on what it is that we might find acceptable ahead of time and be able to work with them on that um, the new mayor in Marlboro is eager to move forward on this and so they've they're planning to go to the city council with modifications for the whole Donald Lynch Boulevard. That is zoned light industrial, I guess is the term they use. And they want to modify the use chart um, and probably some other dimensional requirements as well. But they want to modify the use chart for the, for the whole underlying zone when the, the lawyer that was there today representing the mall folks was not, he hadn't ever seen the development agreement that, that we negotiated and he wasn't particularly familiar with the, with the overlay district language. And so I, we shared that with him and I think he'll look into that a little more fully. The, the city of mall, what, what I, I think what we tried to accomplish today was to get Marlboro to understand that the full range of uses that they might allow to be added to the use chart for the whole stretch might not entirely be compatible with what was acceptable in Berlin. And that as a result, did they need to um, modify what they might allow in the overlay that involves the mall. 
So it would be slightly different than what they'd allow in the whole strip. And so the the lawyer, um, you know, talked about opportunities to create subzones essentially within a zoning district, and that went back and forth for a while. So what I think we'll need to do at one of our upcoming meetings is look at the full list of potential uses and those that Marlboro, I think, is wanting to embrace that might be added to their use chart for the whole stretch and evaluate those and ask ourselves whether, you know, we feel that would be acceptable. And then that would end up serving as the basis for some of the language that might go into a zoning article for the fall when, you know, a, a modification to the overlay. Uh, but then there also needs to be modifications to the development agreement. And for instance, if Berlin were to allow housing to be incorporated into the, the overlay, which is one of the things we've talked about, um, how would Marlboro then work out the the public safety responsibilities that they have now for the mall? They might look at it entirely in a new light. I mean, you know, right now they tend to take care of the majority of the public safety first response, whereas if there was a housing component, it might change. So there's, it's going to be some work. Um, and I said, Berlin's not in a position normally to hire counsel to come in and and work with us as we modify zoning to meet the proponents, you know, proposals. And so how able are you to assist us in that? <laughs> they, they didn't. They didn't warm up to that comment. They, they're working a pretty slim line right now, I think. They just got word, of course, that Macy's is going to close 150 stores across the country. So, Just heard that today. That's going to be a th yep. third of Macy's stock. So they're they're not sure whether it Im impacts this site or not yet. But So they're, uh, they're, they're worried, obviously. So. You know, the... Um... <clears throat> person that came in to talk to us about new uses, I don't know, a few months ago, did, they, did someone say that they were no longer working on the project? So initially, Peter and I met with um, a group that was working with the mall folks, and, and a week later or two weeks later, they disappeared, and this new Matthew Bader, who we met with, yeah. came on board. And he was there today, and um, he has shared a, a list of sort of a wish list with Liz, and I asked Liz to share that with us so we understood more completely what they looked at as possible, you know, new, new potential uses. And then the use chart that the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission developed for Marlboro for the whole strip is, um, I think it's five pages. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, yeah, six. So there's six pages on a use chart. There's, it's just single entries per line. So um, I'm going to scan this and, and send it independently to everybody because i i believe i've already shared that um, metropolitan area planning commission study and i'll send that again too but i'll I send noticing that there are a lot of malls that are surviving with uh recreation for some reason yep. recreation malls seems to be going and well. and the, and i think when you look at this this potential new use chart uh, if you look at what we allow now in the in the overlay and what Marlboro would allow, um, you know, it it appears to me that there's, there's clearly some opportunities that we would probably embrace, um, and then there are probably some others that we'd be hesitant to, uh, 
to see go forward. Right, but didn't didn't Matthew say that they they didn't do recreation in those? Um, no, because today they were talking about that, and and oh, it's right? it's certainly on Marlboro's list. Um, I think Matthew probably suggested that they didn't have as much familiarity with it, but I don't. I think if I thought it was both sim familiar familiarity and interest. Yeah, I. Right. Well, that may be changing as if both towns are asking for it, and it seems to be the thing that is right. happening with malls. They may be um, understanding that that's something they should look into. And and when we talked about housing, I made it clear, and they remembered Carolyn's um, comment from the last time that we met with Matthew, and that was that the scale of any housing project would be of interest to us, and that the scale that the 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 partners they usually work with on these projects is in excess of probably what we would find acceptable. So I just said you you've really got to understand that a, a housing component may very well be compatible, and and there may be a willingness in Berlin to accept that, but it it would have to be on a scale that wasn't going to be disruptive in our minds. So, uh, and that's the difficulty I think they'd find is that the, most of the developers that would want to come in that are on the national scene would probably balk at the number that we'd be willing to to um, swallow. So, and if we got the pushback that we did about forty units, <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> Yeah. Um, anything, you know, any apartments of greater size, greater numbers. Yeah, I mean, this is a little different than Riverbridge, but um, they need, you know, they're, they're going to throw that on the table. And I think we're going to have to look seriously at it. And <clears throat> I said to them, it was it was important for from our point of view, probably to begin to have the public dialogue fairly soon and try to be transparent about exactly what any modifications would entail um, so that we got the public feedback pretty early on so we could tailor language for the modification to the zoning and the overlay and the use chart. Um, so it was something that we had a reasonable sense that it would pass town meeting. We don't want to I mean, the mall is a, a significant um, player in terms of our tax base, and for it to sit idle or empty um, doesn't help the community at all. So what we need to do is reestablish what uses that you know might potentially be added um, and be compatible and, and uh, try to work that out as best we can. I saw a perfect model this weekend. Whereabouts? Florida. There was a gigantic hotel, and it was called the World Equestrian Center. <laughs> <laughs> well, you lost me at gigantic hotel, but <laughs> it's amazing. Put up, there's like, it's just amazing. It's a huge property, and there's just everything horses going on in a giant hotel where you can overlook the arena where all the top level competitions are going on and stuff well so i don't know I, I, stuff, stuff does it. the other thing that's really interesting is in our town we've got the highland common mall which seems to be really prospering you know it's it's got new businesses that keep opening up very few of them are failing yeah big i mean the the uh <clears throat> lowe's and market basket are always jammed and uh and the gym is doing really well it looks like so that's a big success but then we're kind of struggling with solomon pond so yep funny well fast well, forward to them 25 years and see what they're doing That's well right. exactly i think part, I think part of that is the 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 indoor mall compared to the outdoor shopping center yep oh, you know it's changed we're back right. to we're back to the original one. remember shoppers world in framingham was the first mm -hmm. outdoor yeah yeah <laughs> Which yep. was very successful for a long time. Yeah. What mm -hmm. lifestyle center? Is that what we're Yes, that's what it's that's, called, I guess. Yeah. 
And I, I was looking though at old papers from uh, the mall back in uh, 1994. And uh, in some of the discussion that we put together, we indicated that the mall would probably have a lifespan of about 30 years yep. as uh, you know, in its, in its current iteration and man, I think yeah. we, we pegged that pretty well. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, yeah. we, we clearly had those discussions about it being, you know, a, a, a beast that would only survive a certain amount of time. And that, I mean, I think that, yeah, you're right. That was our forecast. And, and we understood that there would have to be some sort of metamorphosis that would take place that would move it forward. And, you know, here we are. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I pointed out that that record is out there because I think as we go back to the public and the public say, well, you know, why are you changing this? We voted this, you know, yeah, 30 years ago. And even then, you know, we told you that after a certain period of time, it would have to be reconsidered and probably repurposed. Yeah. And, and I think at that point, you know, there were certainly aspects of it that would uh, be beneficial to the town, not only from a tax base point of view, but also just from a user point of view. But now the goal is to evaluate what potential uses they would throw on the table and to try to embrace those that we feel would best benefit the townspeople. So, you know, I, and I think yeah. that can be done, so. Yeah. Yeah, and be the least disruptive. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let me jump in for a second and add to what Tim, uh, what Tim discussed from the meeting. I thought it was pretty productive, but I think there's a, a flow problem I pointed out. The proponent, which is Spinoza, which is the managing agent for the uh, mall, needs to have clarity in their own minds of what their wish list is. And then they need to bring it to the, to the city and the town and try to get it married up with their wish list. And I'm not sure that flow chart, that flow is in place. So I think it's going to struggle some more. So, the other thing, go ahead. So what happened was evidently they have shared with Liz that list and th that hasn't been shared with us. So I said to Liz, could she send it to us? And she said she would. Um, and and with that list in hand and, you know, looking at this use chart, um, you know, I think we could tick off pretty quickly um, a series of, you know, talking points that would help move the discussion along pretty quickly um, to its next phase. I felt I felt more encouraged as we ended the meeting than I did in that midpoint where there was seemed to be a lot of. I mean, we weren't we weren't we weren't in the same room with with Marlboro at the start of the meeting, and I didn't feel. But um, gradually, I think the lawyer and Matt tried to bring us around so that we were probably more in line with what everybody wants. Meredith Harris, which is the Economic Development Committee um, Executive Director or something similar, and the mayor were kind of adversarial to us. And we're not quite sure why. Yeah, I, I think that they felt that it was unlikely that Berlin would want to participate and Actually, we've been asking to participate for a longer period of time than they have, and I, I don't think they really appreciated that. I mean, the report's three years old, and we've been looking at it for years and saying to Liz, we're ready to talk. And, of course, Matthew's only been there, what, for four or five months now, so it's a new team. And they, but they, they do seem reluctant to spend money. Um, is that your impression, Peter? Well, it's not exactly that they don't. They, their equivalent of the executive director, the receiver, apparently is an incredibly careful tightwad. Yeah. And um, when Tim suggested that they fund the attorney that would help us through this, he had a, he skipped a beat. So <laughs> he being Matt Bader, the uh, real estate guy. So I think I think it's a good idea, Tim, for you to suggest that, and I think we can press that with Liz, and she'll make it happen. Well, and they've brought this um, what was his name, James Jim, um, from 
the attorney? Maybe Thomas knows him. James Ward from uh, Nutter Uncommon Law. No, don't know. It's not way outside of my practice, but yeah. But anyway, he, uh, they brought him on board and, and, you know, to me, some of this work has to be carried by him um, and then we review it. Um, I don't think we need to generate a lot of this. I think it's the burdens on them um, in reaction to what we th we tentatively agree to, you know, and then they can craft what they think might be modifications to the development agreement. And then we can have Heather White and some of that team from our <laughs> look at it, you know. They seem somewhat reluctant to completely prosecute what they wish will happen. They seem worried about putting their ideas on the table, even so they have. Do you, you seem say? like that when they came to our meeting, too. Yeah. Yeah. Although, well, well that's easy to understand. It'd it's be interesting to see what Liz has got, that document that, that Matt shared with her. So we'll look at that and, and we can see if they're actually moving forward with some serious proposals. So that's our news. Do you feel like by the end of your meeting, Marlboro was less adversarial or continued to be? Because it's a new mayor. It would be nice to be able to start a different kind of relationship. Well, I think the fact that he even showed up is a good sign. Sure. I mean, we, we never... Back, Thomas, you know, 25 years ago, I, I can't remember when we were dealing with Copeland and Page and Rick Tainer and McCabe and all those folks, that there was never much mention of the mayor from Marlboro's chiming in, but this guy wants to be hands-on, so. Yep. He, no, he you're had, right. There was very little communication. He had read the entire document, which seemed to be 20, 30 pages long, and had you know, post-its throughout. Yeah, he it's... Was, he was pretty, he 70, was pretty 70 pages. Wow. Yeah, so he'd done some homework. He I think they were more comfortable by the end. Yeah, he suggested that they'd already done the work and all we had to do was sign do off it. on it. And I said, <laughs> I said, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. And uh, besides, you, know, you didn't do this work. It was done years ago before you were mayor, and it was done by a, a you know, a planning commission for the region. So you know. It's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice but try. But he was there, so that was a good sign. And she sure. was there, you know. So I think, and Peter's worked with uh, Meredith before, so. I mean, I mean, I think we were encouraged. Good. And something clearly has to be done. I mean, we we can't let this just spiral out of control and end up being an empty graveyard over there. It's no, yeah, absolutely doesn't serve anybody's best interest. Yep. Did anybody look at the uh, news to see if our Macy's was on the list by chance? They hadn't they identified the 150. I don't believe. They just said there were 150. And they interviewed someone from the some residents that live at the Natick Mall. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. They hmm. between Neiman Marcus and Wegmans. They've lost some big anchors over there. Yeah. They had a Wegmans and they lost it. Yeah. Yeah. It opened inside the mall. Hmm. And so that, closed that... what two years later? Three years? Yeah. Just a couple of months, a few months ago. Yeah. That Wegmans was run by Jason Rowell, who you guys have met. He's on the EDC. Yeah. 500 what? people work for him. Wow. And it's interesting because that seemed like a really good fit, especially with the um, condos that they have over there that also are attached to the mall. Apparently, people didn't like going into a mall to go supermarket shopping. Parking. 
Yep. Which is, again, kind of the difference between the inside mall and an outside shopping center. Yeah. You know, nobody has a problem going up to Market Basket and then going over to Cabela's and then going over to, you know, PetSmart or whatever. Um, right. But to do all of that inside a mall <clears throat> it's true. feels weird. Hmm? I, I read about that. That's a big factor. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at where Shoppers World was, what they replaced it with is what you just said. It's multiple outdoor stores where you drive from one to the other. Yep. Yeah. New no. model. <laughs> but we've already got, we're already like the premier place for hockey, indoor hockey, right? We right. learned that there's 10 ice rinks, is that right? Or 11 ice rinks here? Yep. That's yeah. insane. We had 10 equestrian rinks. We could be the leaders in that too. <laughs> I know where one of them would be. <laughs> I move that we adjourn. A second. A second. All right, we got a motion and a second to adjourn. It's non-discussable, so we'll ask you to vote. Jay Teach. Aye. Tim Wheeler. Aye. Colin McDonald. Aye. Thomas Andrew. Aye. Peter Hoffman. I abstain. Tom Stanford, aye. Motion carries unanimous.